Shifting focus for now, our next story is from the United States. Last week, ratings agency Fitch downgraded U.S. credit rating and a week on, the country has been dealt another financial setback, this time from Moody's, one of America's premier business and financial services company. On Monday, Moody's downgraded the credit ratings of several U.S. banks by one notch. And it further warned it was checking the status of some of the country's biggest lenders. In other words, it has placed some other American banking giants on review for potential downgrades. And the agency also, by the way, changed its outlook to negative for several major lenders. So overall, it has changed the assessments of 27 banks in the sector. 27. The list of downgraded banks includes MNT Bank, Pinnacle Financial Partners, Prosperity Bank, and BOK Financial Corporation. And if we speak of the banks placed on review for downgrade, the list includes BNY Mellon, US Bancorp, State Street, and Truist Financial. Now, what is the reason behind the downgrade? I'll tell you what Moody's has said in a note. Let me quote from it. Many banks quarter two results showed growing profitability pressures that will reduce their ability to generate internal capital. This comes as a mild recession looms and banks contend with greater risks from interest rates and managing their assets and liabilities. Immediately after this decision was announced, the markets were alarmed. A lot of bank stocks tumbled. U.S. Bank Corp fell 2.2%. Wall Street was down 1.2%. Truist shares declined by 1.6%. Even big banks like J.P. Morgan Chase and the Bank of America fell down 1.5% and 1.9% respectively. The fallout is tragic and what's worse, it comes amid a series of financial troubles. Like I said, last week, Fitch ratings downgraded the U.S. sovereign credit grade, or what is popularly called the long-term foreign currency issuer default rating. It was downgraded, down, downgraded by one level. From a rating of AAA, it came down to AA+. Why is that? Because of America's ballooning fiscal deficit, also erosion of governance. This is what Fitch said in a statement. The rating downgrade of the United States reflects the expected physical deterioration over the next three years, a high and growing general government debt burden, and the erosion of governance over the last two decades that has manifested in repeated debt limit standoffs and last-minute resolutions. For the unworse, the credit rating reflects the credit worthiness of an individual, company, or government. So basically, you can say that Fitch has downgraded America's credit worthiness. And now Moody's has downgraded the credit rating of several banks. How should we view this? The obvious questions that come to mind are, is this a banking crisis? Are these signs of a recession? No, say experts, like the chief economist of J.P. Morgan Chase. He says the bank is no longer forecasting a U.S. recession this year. In fact, it has raised its economic growth estimate as the economy expands at a quote-unquote healthy pace. And if we quantify this, the firm has increased its current quarter real annualized GDP growth estimate to 2.5% from 0.5%. So what is this then and why are American banks being downgraded? Why has America's own credit rating been downgraded? Well, the answer is America's budget deficit. It shrank last year, but now it's widening again. So these downgrades are nothing but signals that America needs to get its budgetary process in order. I want to end the show by telling you about something that happened on board a flight. It is a story that stands out for multiple reasons. But before I get to it, let me ask you this. Imagine you are on a flight. The flight attendant asks you, would you like something sweet or savory? You prefer savory at that point and you possibly get some peanuts. How many? A packet? 
maybe you want some more two packets maybe three what if you end up buying 48 packets of peanuts on board the flight well that is exactly what a uk woman actually did I know that sounds like a lot, but as they say, desperate times call for desperate measures. As per the woman, she bought every single packet of peanuts on the flight. But why did she do that? Why did she buy 48 packets of peanuts? As per this report, the woman has a severe nut allergy. And she has claimed that she had no choice but to buy all those packets of peanuts because the cabin crew as per the report, ignored her request to not serve them. Basically, she did not want anyone opening a packet of peanuts while she was inside the aircraft. And according to this report, the woman has said that she has asked the staff on the Euro Wings flight to announce her allergy to passengers and request that they don't buy or eat peanuts. She claims her concerns were dismissed by the crew. And so she ended up buying all the packets of peanuts. You know how much she spent? 144 euros. That, by the way, is almost thrice the airfare price that she shelled out, almost three times. And the woman now wants a refund. This report in The Independent carries a statement by a Eurowing spokesperson, according to which the woman was not forced to buy all packages of peanuts on board. The statement says the person tried to offer her an alternative solution by informing all passengers sitting around her about the allergy and that she agreed at first, but then decided to still buy all the packages, as per the statement. And the airline says it is unable to guarantee that the aircraft is free of foodstuffs that that may trigger an allergic reaction such as peanuts because passengers are allowed to bring their own food on board. And the report also mentions that the spokesperson said the medically trained cabin crew always have access to medication to provide emergency medical care in the event of an intolerance or allergic shock on board. The thing is, when it comes to allergies, the policies of airlines on allergies vary a lot. And this latest incident has once again brought that issue back in the spotlight. Do looks matter in a professional space? If you are attractive, can it help you make bigger bucks? And if you are not, will that hurt your career? These are debatable topics. Deep down, you might feel that looks do have some role to play. You may already know about what's called as pretty privilege. You know how good-looking people tend to get special treatment. But studies show that this privilege is not just limited to social interactions, it makes its presence felt in workspaces as well. You heard that right. Attractive people tend to earn more money than average-looking people. Can you believe that? It's dubbed as the beauty premium. Have a look at this Harvard study. It is titled, Why Beauty Matters. The study claims workers of above average beauty earn about 10% to 15% more. The beauty premium is even greater for attractive men. They close more deals, are more likely to get leadership roles as well. Have you noticed this around you? How CEOs or presidential candidates are generally tall men, better looking job seekers are more likely to get hired. Why does this even happen? What explains this bias? And if you are not born with the best of facial features, is your career doomed? And is that even fair? You see, it's all about the confidence levels. Those who are physically attractive know that they look good. They have a greater sense of power, more effective non-verbal presence. This confidence often leads to better communication skills, which employers interpret as competence. And with that, it seems, comes higher pay and more growth opportunities. But is that unfair? Yes, to, a, to some extent it is, but you need not worry too much about it. Employers do not tend to favor attractiveness over work experience or skills. It's more like a side benefit. 
In fact, studies show that if you have the required work experience and knowledge, and you also happen to be good looking, then you are likely to land a well paying job. But if you are not that conventionally attractive, as they say, it still will not hurt your career. How can you turn this bias in your favor? Experts say by grooming yourself well, they say dress for the job you want. If you have a job interview, find out the corporate culture and dress accordingly. In fact, you can even take it up a notch and wear an attire slightly above the role you have applied for. The goal essentially is to show that you belong there, to make a subtle impression that you are the right fit. That's right. Take a look at this study. It mentions that a well-groomed person earns more money. For instance, a woman of average attractiveness makes about $6,000 more annually than averagely groomed woman. This, she also makes about $4,000 more than her better looking, but less put together colleague. So you see, it's not just the features, but also how you present yourself. Number two, appear confident. That's very important. No matter how you look, if you are confident and likable, chances are you will get the job. Next time you appear for an interview, pay attention to your body language, sit up straight or stand tall, maintain eye contact and definitely smile more. At the end of the day, beauty standards are a social construct and they keep evolving with time. Back in the day, those who looked good were assumed to be healthy. And we still tend to carry that same bias subconsciously. But with some confidence, you can overcome that bias. We are now available in your country. Download the app now. Get all the updates on the move.